The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Jenny Fraser, and I'm the president of the Mid-Atlantic Chapter. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Welcome to Tomorrowland, how emerging technologies will change the insights function over the next 10 years. Before I introduce today's presenter, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to mention. This call is being recorded. All participants are defaulted to the listen-only mode so that your background noise cannot be heard. Today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes. If you are PRC certified, the credit for the webinar will be applied to your record in the topic area of research. If you're participating in today's webinar as a group, please have the registered attendee send a list of names via email to receive PRC credit. There will be a question and answer session held at the end of the presentation. To ask questions, please type your comments into the questions panel on the toolbar. We will try our best to get everyone's questions answered. Questions are answered on a first-come, first-served basis. All registered attendees should have a copy of today's slides via email. The recording of today's webinar will be posted on MRA's website. If you have audio problems or technical issues during this program, please call 1-800-263-6317. Today's speaker is Leonard Murphy, Chief Editor and Principal Consultant, GreenBook. Leonard Murphy has been in the market research industry for over a decade in various senior level roles, most notably as CEO of full service agency Rockhopper Research, CEO of tech-driven startup Brandscan360, and senior partner of strategic consultancy Gen2 Advisors. A major aspect of his work focuses on collaborating with multiple organizations to help advance innovation and strategic positioning of the market research industry, most prominently as the editor-in-chief of the Green Book blog and Green Book Research Industry Trends Report two of the most widely read and influential publications in the global insights industry. Mr. Murphy is a key consultant to numerous insights-focused organizations on both the supplier and the client side, and an advisor to several technology startups via his consulting practice. He is involved with numerous organizations, including the Insight Innovation Exchange, the ARF, New York AMA, new MR and University of Michigan Masters in Marketing Research Program. He is also chairs and produces conferences globally in collaboration with other leading organizations and speaks about the future of insights and how to deliver maximum business impact at many events annually. Leonard lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his five children. Welcome, Leonard. Thank you, Jenny, and boy, I should have uh, shortened that bio for you. Um, <laughs> that was a mouthful, wasn't it? Um, but I appreciate it, and uh, thanks to uh, everybody who's attending for, uh, for joining us today. So this is the first time that uh, I have done this particular presentation, so I want to kind of set the stage that I view this really as a brainstorming session. Um, I've identified a few key technologies that I believe will be impacting our industry over the next decade. Uh, I'll run through this fairly quickly. I would expect maybe 30 minutes. And hopefully the remainder of the time, we can bounce ideas back and forth against each other and, uh, and see what we all think about how this is going to play. So I call this uh, Welcome to Tomorrowland. Um, Tomorrowland is uh, an exhibit that Disney has at many of their parks to uh, showcase visions of the future. Um, of course, over the years, uh, it's changed quite a bit in what the future may look like. Uh, I think it's appropriate as we think about uh, this particular topic. So first, let's set the context. I don't think anybody here is going to be surprised to know that our industry is under an immense amount of pressure. Uh, there's economic factors. Uh, the, the global downturn certainly uh, uh, brought that to a head, and I think it's continued to be uh, a significant factor if we look at the, uh, the uh, reports from SMR and, and MRA and other associations certainly indicates that uh, the industry is yet to recover. Uh, my personal opinion is that the industry, as it is traditionally defined, is going to have a hard time recovering overall, and we're going to talk about some of the reasons why that is. Uh, one is technology, 
and uh, we're certainly going to talk about technology as it looks in the future, but even the technologies of today, mobile, social, big data, all these buzz terms that I'm sure you're familiar with uh, are spinning off new competitors, the next issue, um, where many companies are emerging that uh, may not do what we would consider market research, but certainly are positioning themselves in the business of insights and offer multiple paths that are data-driven towards uh, companies understanding what's happening in the marketplace and making decisions based upon that information. Uh, client needs are changing. Um, I'm in an interesting position where I engage with, with lots of client organizations as a bit of a, an innovation consultant. And what I hear over and over and over again is we need things that move the needle for us more. It's not enough for us to be looking in the past. We need to be looking into the future. And we need to understand what's driving consumers so ultimately we can identify new paths to grow our market. Uh, all of these things are impacting the skill sets that are the norm in our industry. Um, we're actually going to look at some of the, the new, uh, the lexicon of research of the future. And it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the things that we think about today. Uh, so there's certainly broad implications for what skill sets are necessary for success, which I think will be particularly important for the MRA members, um, uh, particularly for, uh, for PRC certification. And then, of course, there's consumers. Um, the, uh, there's certainly debates on how much consumers have really changed over the last few years, but I don't think any of us would debate that they have. That the introduction of new technologies, particularly mobile and social and uh, ubiquitous access to content, um, to open ratings, to information at the consumer level, and the way that consumers share information back and forth is certainly radically different than the way most of us were uh, brought up in, uh, in the industry. So there's a lot of pressure there. So I mentioned uh, you know, one piece of this, how it really impacts the, uh, the research industry, is that all of these various forces, and particularly technology, but not only, have given us an opportunity to look at data in what well, I think it was three distinct buckets. Now, one is attitudinal. You know, that's our traditional market research models. You know, we ask questions, uh, you know, attitude and usage studies, brand perception, focus groups, whatever the case may be. It's primarily attitudinal data that we have collected historically. It's behavioral. A lot of the new technologies that are emerging give an immense amount of behavioral data. And when we talk about big data, mostly we're talking about behavioral. We're not simply talking about metrics. Um, we're talking about being able to observe uh, consumers in mass and, uh, and at an individual level to understand their specific behaviors. Geolocation is certainly a component of that. Uh, some of the tracking work that's being done in stores, uh, you know, facial recognition, you name it. Uh, these are, are factors that impact behavioral. And then there's the intrinsic, and this is what my, my associate Greg Archibald uh, uses to bucket in the idea of, of emotional, of values, of those things that are not easy for us to quantify, but certainly are drivers of behavior um, that are the hidden buttons inside consumers. And increasingly, uh, what I'm hearing is a focus from brands to really understand that. They get the attitudinal, they're starting to get the behavioral, and now the missing link is that intrinsic. How do we get to those intrinsic qualities? Um, let's call that the why, or, uh, for lack of a better term. And I think that that's uh, increasingly where research has to play is in combining these three categories and getting to that, that why piece. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to accomplish that. I want to apologize in advance. I do have a bit of a cold. Um, uh, so if I occasionally have to, to stop for a second and take a drink, um, please forgive me. The, I'm taking medicine to dry up all the yucky stuff. So let's look over the horizon. Let's start with the Internet of Things. Now, the Internet of Things is uh, this grand and glorious concept, which is based on the idea that uh, in the near term, um, effectively, every type of device you can imagine, uh, whether it be your automobiles or your refrigerators or your shoes, uh, planes, whatever the case may be, are all sending and receiving data in some form or fashion. Um, I mean, truly, the idea of the Internet of Things is that eventually 
uh, most devices that we utilize in our daily lives will be connected and will be sharing information. And that is, is not far off. Actually, uh, during 2008, the number of things connected to the Internet exceeded the number of people on the Earth, uh, which I found to be surprising. I didn't know we were quite that, uh, that far yet. Uh, and the projection is that by 2020, there will be 50 billion devices that are sharing information. Um, today, some of the, the major devices we look at for that are automobiles. Uh, certainly smart cars are sharing information back and forth via sensors. We're seeing the introduction of more of uh, those devices at home, um, often in our entertainment systems, uh, televisions, Xboxes, uh, cable systems. Uh, those are our Internet of Things devices, uh, but also our appliances are sharing information. Um, uh, just an explosion of things that are capturing tons of inf or tons of data, and often that data is reflective of consumer behaviors, particularly as we look at uh, consumer products that are being used. It's interesting if you even look at some of the the entertainment devices. Xbox, as part of the release of the new Xbox systems, um, records all of your media content consumption via that device. You know, all of that is stored by Microsoft. They have that now. TiVo is doing the same thing. DVR boxes do the same thing. So it's not a question anymore of is that data available? It absolutely is available. The question that most folks are still wrangling with is how do you use it? And when we talk about data, we're talking about some strange terms like the Bronto Byte. I've never heard of that before until I did the research for this. Uh, so <laughs> we have a whole new classification of, of data volumes um, that are coming in. You know, we're, I'm sure all familiar with megabytes and gigabytes and even terabytes, uh, but now we're, we're progressing to pass that into, you know, petabytes and exabytes and yottabytes and zettabytes and then the bronobyte. So masses and masses and masses of data, truly big data that's being generated by all of these. And there's tons of companies that have emerged that are already playing and aggregating and synthesizing that information. The, uh, I don't have a slide here, but the uh, projection by Gartner is that the big data industry alone is already the equivalent of the market research industry. It's $34 billion roughly uh, globally. Uh, and those companies are primarily focused on harnessing this information, not necessarily what is done with it, but certainly gathering it together and utilizing it in a variety of different ways. So the, the Internet of Things is, uh, I think, this broad encompassing web that's going to be uh, critical to looking at new data streams that we'll be harnessing in the future. Part of that is this idea of the quantified self. Um, now, this visual obviously uh, is, is a fitness fanatic, and, uh, and we have certainly seen the, uh, the, the growth of this quantified self model for people that are really engaged with, with physical fitness. But it's not just confined to that. So hopefully some of you saw earlier this year a gentleman put his own personal data that he had been recording uh, up for sale to the highest bidder. That was a quantified self-play. And now we're seeing more and more companies that are emerging. Uh, one out of the UK called Handshake just a few weeks ago that positions themselves as competitor to market research uh, that is harnessing and collecting all of the individual's personal data through a variety of, of data streams and devices, allowing the consumer to set a price on that data and selling it uh, to companies for both engaging in research or for marketing materials. So more and more this idea of, the, of a person owning their data and collecting that data in a variety of ways and then monetizing that is going to, to continue to increase. The UN has classified personal data as an asset class. Um, uh, now it's simply up to technologists and marketers to figure out how to, to do that. So lots of information flowing in through this. And it's not just biometric. The band that she is wearing in this picture uh, is uh, at least theoretically designed to, uh, to understand uh, EEG. Now, if there's any neuroscientists on the call, then you may say, oh, there's no way in heck that uh, a one-sensor band is going to record that, and I'd probably agree with you. But there's other things that are entering the market uh, that have more sensors and are a little more stylish that are designed to actually record emotional information from the consumer that's connected into to other devices like an iPhone or an iPad uh, that is capturing neurological activity as well as physical activity. 
So this is, is something that exists today. Corollary to that is wearable tech. Uh, wearable tech is not necessarily focused so much on recording the uh, more of your physical or, or biometric aspects, but it's the extension of your mobile device, with it, which is already recording tons of information, and making that something that's a little more integrated. Uh, in the last month, we saw the introduction of Samsung smartwatches. Of course, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the idea of Google Glass. Uh, we are seeing implanted uh, sensors and barcodes uh, on humans. Even in the past week, the, uh, the launch of the new iPhone has, an, has a, a fingerprint sensor on it. Um, these are extensions of wearable tech, extensions of this idea of what uh, uh, Kurzweil calls the, uh, I'm sorry, I just, <laughs> what does he call it? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the singularity, thank you, there we go. Uh, the singularity approaching this integration of humans and technology uh, to such an extent that eventually it becomes uh, almost inseparable. Um, you know, obviously there's concerns, particularly with Google Glass, around privacy because of its ability to record your, your surroundings, what's going on around you. But I think that the, the point here is that more and more humans are going to be utilizing devices in a variety of ways uh, that record information about them and about their activities and where they are and stores that information and allows it to be utilized by others. Uh, in a variety of ways, which you know, a lot of that can be market research. 3D printing. Um, 3D printing is fascinating. If there's any technology that possibly has the ability to almost change our world in fundamental ways, it's probably 3D printing. Um, the prices come down. So you see to the left one of the you know kind of big industrial size 3D printers that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, is that cold? Uh, but we also have small portable devices that fit on your desktop uh, that now are just a few hundred dollars. I, I was sharing with uh, with Lisa and Jenny that I've actually asked for one of these for Christmas, um, and I hope that I get one. Um, for research, I think about the idea of rapid prototyping. Uh, when you're doing product design, product ideation, you know, working through some conceptual stuff uh, with consumers, the ability to, to rapidly prototype out a product and print it on site is amazing. Uh, you can go through, you know, real physical product designs in uh, within a matter of minutes, uh, not a matter of days or months. Um, so the ability to 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 get products to market faster uh, it has immense opportunities. With when we're looking at qualitative research, um, within quantitative research, the uh, imagine a world where most consumers have three D printers, just as they have physical printers and paper printers today. Participating in an online ideation session, uh, folks are, are collaborating on designing a new product, doing a feature and benefits trade-off. Um, uh, let's say it's a conjoint design, and once it's agreed that here's the next prototype, everybody clicks print and prints that product, touches it, feels it, looks at it. Amazing implications. The shoes, the New Balance shoes down at the, uh, the bottom right are 3D printed shoes. Uh, those were done on a 3D printer. So a uh, huge implication. They're even exploring now with uh, 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 printing biological materials. Um, I don't know if I would sign up to eat a 3D burger myself yet, um, but again, we're, we're, we can even get into sensory testing. Um, the technology exists and is being refined rapidly to be able to do uh, some amazing things. We have innovation crowdsourcing. This is a screenshot of Spigot. Uh, Spigot is uh, an innovation ideation page. Um, this uh, iteration also includes a prediction market. So the idea is for consumers uh, that uh, share ideas, um, the crowd votes on them, and then brands engage with them and take it to the next level. Um, yeah, Spigot is, is a fairly large company. They're the darling of uh, venture capitalists right now. Uh, I know many companies in the, uh, the CPG category and, and others that are working with them. Um, this is certainly a place where market research should be playing, but we don't play nearly enough because these type of crowdsourced uh, innovation models have 
emerged and have some very interesting differences from the way that, uh, that we approach things. So uh, I think we're going to see more and more of, of this type of crowdsourced uh, innovation and co-creation occurring outside of the, the market research space. Uh, there's a lot for us to learn here. Open ratings. Uh, this is an example of a uh, uh, an iPhone rating that you share across your social sphere, Yelp, Google, Foursquare, Facebook. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, Foursquare recently launched a ratings system. So when you check in at Foursquare, you can rate your experience right there and then. Um, you know, it's real-time customer experience feedback. Um, the extensions of this for ideas like mystery shopping, uh, of course, customer satisfaction uh, are, are immense. It's being done today. It's growing. My friend Bob Moran calls this the ratocracy. The, uh, the world that we live in where we're effectively able to rate virtually everything instantaneously on a portable device uh, at the point of experience. So huge implications for, for market research. Uh, unfortunately, huge implications from a competitive standpoint that uh, may be more challenging for us. Going a little further out, the idea of cognitive computing. Now, we talk about, you know, that it's still, we still need a human to get to context, uh, to understand the why. Uh, but there is certainly rapid advances being made that are combining technologies like neuroscience, like supercomputing, and nanotechnology to create machines that are able to think contextually. Uh, they go beyond simply storing data, uh, like Watson, the, uh, the image that we have there. Um, and can think for all intents and purposes. Not think freely, but to be able to take in lots of different data streams, lots of, of different factors, think about them contextually, and paint a picture of what the implications of that really may be in the future. Now, I would say this is probably closer to 20 years out before we would see widespread adoption. But there's no, uh, there's no accounting for black swans. Um, and the way that Moore's Law seems to be increasing at this point uh, in terms of the ability for technology to leapfrog itself uh, exponentially over and over again, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw significant breakthroughs within the next few years and that we start seeing the rolling out of cognitive computing combined with big data uh, that would create some very interesting opportunities for market research and some very interesting competition uh, for those of us that are engaged in, uh, in market research. Emotional measurement. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the, again, what I hear from brands more and more is they want to understand the why. They want to understand the unconscious drivers of behavior. Um, there's lots of, of models to get to emotional measurement. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with fMRI or with EEG. Those things are not scalable, but there's other solutions such as facial scanning, uh, such as the, the biometric stuff that we saw earlier in the uh, quantified self. Um, uh, there's cognitive approaches that are more uh, neuropsychologically based. Um, uh, companies like uh, Forbes Consulting, their MindSight model, uh, a variety of others that are playing in the market research uh, sector and are able to achieve scalability for emotional measurement. I actually read yesterday that Intel in Israel is uh, developing 3D cameras for integration in laptops and PCs that come embedded with, uh, with facial scanning software to do emotional measurement. So obviously, you know, Intel doesn't invest in these types of things just for the heck of it. You know, they see the opportunity. I was on a call with a uh, investment firm earlier today, and we were discussing a company uh, that is introducing a uh, facial uh, facial coding emotional measurement platform that's like SurveyMonkey. It's a DIY uh, platform that can be deployed and integrated in with a variety of other systems. So more and more of these technologies will start to, to define things in real time. Um, as well as certainly playing a role within market research. On the flip side of that is also biometric measurement. I have a, an example here of facial scanning, but there's pupil dilation. Recently, Google patented a uh, pupil dilation measurement platform 
or system to be integrated into Google Glass for the, uh, the sole purpose of measuring emotional response to advertising that you're being, that's being observed in real time. Uh, the upper right is an example of a system deployed by uh, 3M that duplicates uh, where the eye is drawn um, uh, in any type of, of stimuli, visual stimuli. There's no human required. It's, it was built by neuroscientists who work for 3M uh, and they heat map where the eye is drawn uh, automatically. Uh, to the, uh, the bottom right is an example of a company called um, Shop Reception out of uh, uh, Latin America that has taken the Xbox systems and deploy those within stores to actually record where consumers go within the store and particularly what they're looking at from a shelf uh, standpoint uh, and is utilizing that with you know in stores to be you know real-time testing about shelf placement where the eye is drawn um, reaction to pop displays etc cetera, etc cetera. you know all of these are are in commercial use now and will continue to uh, to progress in their adoption and and how they're being uh, utilized by researchers to deliver more data so all of that kind of takes us this idea of a new vocabulary for market research and you know, there's not a lot here that uh, most of you are probably used to um, uh, you know I wish you could raise your hand. I'd ask the question of raise your hand if you know what Hadoop is. Um, you know, Hadoop is a big data platform uh, generated by IBM, but you know, if you're not paying attention to those things, it, it, we're not going to know that. HBase, MapReduce, you know, these are terminologies used by data scientists, uh, which effectively have more to do with programming than they have to do with uh, statisticians. And increasingly, if these are the skill sets that are going to be called upon as we're looking at all of this data coming through all of these new technologies. Uh, they become engineering issues more than anything. I was actually just reading an a article in Time Magazine about Google's launch of a new, uh, new program called Calico, which is their attempt to actually uh, solve death. That's, that's Google's stated goal, <laughs> is to, to solve death. And made the point that you know you don't bet against them because they have access to so much data and they look at it as an engineering problem they look at it as the ability to take data in from a variety of sources and once you develop the right algorithms then you can find the answer and I think that's probably the core message of this entire presentation is that you know these are things that market research has to embrace we have to start thinking about uh, moving outside of our limited approach of, of asking questions or observing behavior and recognize that we don't own the channels of data anymore. We own a few, uh, and even that is arguable. Uh, there's tons and tons and tons that are emerging in other ways that we need to be open to looking at how they can be used to do our primary business, which is really help brands make smarter decisions. Um, to uh, to enable brands to grow their businesses. In my opinion is that uh, if somebody asks me what I do as a market researcher, I say I help people sell more stuff. Um, that may sound incredibly mercenary, but the bottom line is that is what we do. Whether it's an idea or a product or a concept uh, or a message, we help people sell more stuff. And the way we do that is by harnessing information in a way that informs their decisions. And increasingly, we're going to have to use a lot of different tools uh, to enable us to effectively do that. So here's some of the terminology that we're going to have to get used to um, and start becoming familiar with and how we use that. Now, this, uh, and this is the last slide, and I do want to get into, uh, into Q&A on this. When we think about the, the competitors of market research in the future, well, these are them. Google, it's IBM, it's Apple, it's General Electric, it's AT&T, Telefonica, it's Verizon, Microsoft, Amazon, AOL, Yahoo, Publicis Omnicom, Facebook. Why? Because almost all of this data that we've just talked about in some form or fashion is going to run through one or many of these companies. They are the primary conduits 
and in many cases the primary owners of the data that's aggregated and collected through all of these technologies, whether it be our mobile devices or Google Glass or the Internet of Things, uh, whatever the case may be. The uh, Publicis Omnicom merger was very vocal that they did, they did it to compete with Google. And uh, it was driven by one of their big data uh, initiatives to try and aggregate uh, information from lots of different sources to be able to predict uh, advertising behavior so they can help advertisers more effectively. You know, Google is certainly doing exactly the same thing, um, except they don't need to aggregate it. They have it already. Um, IBM has been on a buying spree for analytics companies. And last, well, two or three weeks ago, um, uh, they launched uh, an agency-based model uh, that is utilizing their, uh, their big data assets or analytical assets to be able to help brands make better marketing decisions. Um, uh, AT&T, uh, for years, has been rumored to find, be looking at ways to monetize all of their transactional uh, and, uh, and data that's being carried over their networks. Um, uh, Verizon already has done that by opening up a lot of their data to, uh, to brands. Um, Microsoft, of course, uh, the, even this morning I saw that they've been uh, expanding uh, some of the capabilities of, of Excel to do more data visualization, uh, and increasingly they're owning uh, a lot of data coming through the, the Xbox devices. If they ever get it right from, from mobile, then they'll be uh, having all of that. Of course, Amazon, AOL, Yahoo, Facebook, uh, they all channel information right now to try and generate uh, targeted advertising for consumers, um, and they do that because they capture lots and lots of behavioral information. Yahoo owns a panel company in uh, uh, in the Middle East, so these are the companies that we're going to be bouncing up against, and hopefully finding ways to partner with more effectively as we head into the future. Uh, it, it's not necessarily going to be the the, the the large research companies that have predominantly defined the market. Um, and with, when we throw these companies into the mix, if we look at, let's say, the Honda Michael 50, well, you know, Google could buy and sell the entire global market research industry as a whole without blinking an eye. IBM probably could too. Apple certainly could too. Um, these are big companies with lots of assets and lots of resources. And we need to find ways to be inspired by what they're doing, to utilize the tools that they're sharing and creating and finding new ways to deliver value to our clients in this brave new world that we find ourselves in that is flush with bronobytes of data. So that's my take on uh, how technology is potentially going to redefine the industry. Um, I would love to uh, now spend the rest of the time just kind of going back and forth with you guys. Um, challenge me. Uh, tell me I'm full of crap. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> give me your thoughts, and let's see where we can get to. So thank you. Jenny? Um, and it's actually Lisa, but that's okay. I have oh, Lisa, sorry. for you. Nah, it's all right. Um, so your first question, are the companies that collect this data, um, Foursquare, Google, et cetera, making it available to market researchers and others, either for a fee or not? In some cases, yes, primarily via API. So if you look at the, the social media monitoring companies, for instance, um, they, uh, they are buying their company, or their, the data, we call it the fire hose, okay? So they, they access the fire hose of data um, either directly or most usually through aggregators, companies like DataSift or GNIP <coughs> that uh, are accessing that information. So yes, it, it is, the short answer is it is available. Um, not always all of it. There's some that they hold back. Um, but the uh, but there's ways to do that. Now, what's interesting, though, that's kind of a follow-on to that, is is we look at companies like Handshake that I mentioned earlier. Um, another one is uh, is Pure Profile that is in the research space, uh, and other folks. Uh, they're taking the approach of developing themselves as a third-party plugin, very similar to any other app that you would enable on Facebook. So the consumer can make the decision to share this data. And rather than getting the full fire hose of, you know, of, of all of Facebook's customers or all you know, Twitter users, instead on an individual level, 
they're building up access to these data streams by engaging with the consumer directly to allow them to do that. So that is another path to access a lot of this as well. Okay. Um, how will researchers be able to use data from the Internet of Things? I think that effectively becomes uh, behavioral data. So we're looking at, uh, so let's say you're, let's say automotive, for instance. Um, for an automotive manufacturer to understand um, your driving habits, uh, how often, uh, how far do you drive to work, how often do you brake, what's the, uh, what's your gas mileage like, what radio stations do you listen to, um, what are your settings on your seat, um, you know, a variety of things. Uh, for them to be able to continue to refine those products to be able to appeal towards, uh, uh, to broader trends would be important. Um, so a lot of these things would re I mean, not replace, but certainly allow us to fine tune uh, product and concept testing or uh, you know ethnographies, uh, those type of approaches in a way with uh, at, at massive scale based on the individual consumer's behavior. So the million dollar question, um, how do, how are, how is the industry going to get um, population adoption of these, these technological breakthroughs? Um, privacy being a huge issue and of course the government always steps in and says be afraid of it. So how, how does the, how is the industry going to combat that? How, how are they going to get uh, adopters and, and the population on board? Well, first, I, I don't believe that privacy is a big issue. Privacy is a big issue for government um, because they don't like not having control. Um, so, sorry, that sounds like a political statement. I don't mean it to be, but actually studies, much data shows that roughly 70% of the population are happy to share most any data available as long as you're getting value back from it. So, you know, is 30% a big number? Maybe. Um, but 70% is a bigger number. And that's been pretty consistent. Now, that is certainly in the U.S. In, uh, in Europe, particularly in Germany, there's larger challenges, and we need to be clear about that. But, you know, I think that the, the, the bottom line, and this really goes to, to your question, if we can demonstrate to consumers the value of sharing information uh, and how it can be used to make their lives better, um, and how they can gain from it, uh, not just in terms of products and services, but through offers, through rewards, through direct monetization, then that changes the game. I've often thought that uh, if Facebook had simply given every single member of Facebook a small stock share when they went public, they would probably be the most highly valued brand in the world today. Um, because then they would have been incenting the consumers directly to continue to participate and share in that information. So the companies that I mentioned previously, uh, again, Handshake, uh, a great example of one, uh, you know, they, that is their value proposition. They are engaged with consumers directly and saying, we're going to empower you. We're going to let you control your data and, uh, and let you control the level of engagement that you have with all of these different uh, different organizations who want a relationship with you, either through research or through marketing. Um, you know, I, I know for a fact that one of the uh, the largest CPG companies in the world um, is actively looking at funding them. Um, so that's just one example, and there's others that have already uh, that are in existence that are growing. So I think that consumer value proposition is really one of just communicating the value exchange uh, accurately and completely and letting them make that choice. And my, my fundamental belief is that if we do that, everything else is a non-issue. And they will flock. And, and again, if you think about it, why was Google successful? Google was successful, successful because they generated the best content, the best information, the best user experience for the consumer. Facebook has been successful 
for the same thing. Now, they've generated ads that are generally, not always, meaningful to the consumer. Amazon, absolutely, uh, generally, you know, with a very high success rate, generates interesting offers to me based upon them understanding my behavior as an Amazon shopper. So I continue to use those products because I find value in that. That's it. Okay. The help? Sure. I think it's great. Um, some of it's a little creepy, so you can you can almost hear people out there being a little afraid of uh, of the creep factor. Um, yeah. But uh, so, have there been any companies that have been able to bring all of these different data sets together in a way that provides a more holistic picture? Uh, IBM certainly is uh, probably furthest along that path. They actually, uh, gosh, uh, about two months ago. Um, there was an article in, uh, I think maybe The Economist, um, of uh, an IBM solution that uh, was a big data analytics solution um, that also had a very advanced text analytics emotional measurement component um, and had an algorithm to identify values and drivers of behavior. Um, and this was all being pioneered by, uh, I think, folks at Stanford or MIT, you know, one of the, the, the big think tank, um, with a very high level of success. So, so yes, um, you know, that's a public way. And my basic assumption is that when it starts being talked about publicly, then privately it's much further along by somebody else. Um, so uh, I think that as we're starting to hear about these things now in a public setting, that means that you know, we're probably within the next uh, the next five years. We'll see very large uh, public rollouts of fairly mature offerings. So that's one. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Google sits on an awful lot as well. <laughs> and um, so you talked about uh, 3D printing, um, and you you mentioned um, some examples of how 3D printing could be used. Uh, with research, how else could uh, could we leverage uh, 3D printing for research? Uh, boy, this is why I, I wish we could take people off mute because um, this would be almost a time for everybody to kind of throw out their ideas, right? The uh, <laughs> 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 I limited uh, 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 my limited imagination, but um, yeah, I, I I tend to focus on the idea of rapid prototyping. Um, but, well, I don't know. My, my brain kind of stalls for a second. Well, how else can we use for research? Right? <laughs> Beyond rapid prototyping. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I think sensory testing, um, uh, at some point we'll get there. We're probably a few years out from having anything that anybody would actually want to put in their mouths um, <laughs> and enjoy. Um, uh, although, well, yeah, yeah so we're probably further out for that. Um, the uh, uh, home use tests, social location tests, um, anything where it's necessary for us to to uh, touch and feel an object, to look at it, hold it in our hands, um, uh, I think there certainly will be applications there. Um, the, uh, the thing about 3D printing is that you can create very complex uh, devices. 3D printing. Um, you certainly can create the components for almost anything. Um, then you may have to put those components together. But theoretically, uh, you know, there's really not a limit to what you can create as long as you have the appropriate schematic. So, uh, yeah, I, I think really kind of the sky's the limit. What do you think, Lisa? Anything for you? Uh, mm, no. <laughs> I'm kind of like you. I'm like, Hmm. What else could there be? But uh, well, I have another question for you. Um, do you think any of this information will ever have the statistical rigor of traditional data collection? And do you think concern for such things is going to wane? I think concern for such things has already waned. Um, and I think what do we define statistical rigor? I mean, for some of these things, potentially, we're almost talking about census level data. Um, not for all. Certainly, but for some. 
Um, you know, statistics is based on the idea that you can't get a uh, you, have to, you have to sample a population, but we can, when you can get the majority of a population, statistics kind of go out the window, right? I mean, we, the, uh, we don't have to sample, per se. Um, we're getting massive amounts of data from folks. Um, now, obviously, there are going to be limits to, uh, to engagement. Uh, I, I saw earlier today there's still about 15% of the population that's diehard, will not engage online. So certainly there's going to be exceptions. Will we ever have 100% census penetration on these technologies? No. I do not believe we will ever achieve 100% census data. Um, although I would challenge that for those small percentage of the populations who don't own a mobile device and aren't going to own a mobile device or are not online and that don't use some of these platforms, are they really people the brands are most concerned about? Probably not. So, you know, they're niche audiences to begin with. So um, I, I think that our ideas around uh, statistical rigor that research was built on are frankly becoming outdated, not because they're not useful, but simply because the ability for us to sample large populations at approaching census levels is radically different than, they used to, than we used to be able to achieve. Uh, oh, one more thing to that. Uh, I, there's a, a website that I frequently call Analytic Bridge that is the home of lots of data scientists. And there is a poll not too long ago um, uh, on whether people prefer the term statisticians or data scientists. And universally, the, uh, the consensus was, yes, I may be a trained statistician, but that doesn't, it's not accurate, doesn't reflect what I do, and it's really not relevant to how I do what I do today. And they embraced the term data scientists because statistics really weren't part of the equation anymore. So I think that's, uh, that's a pretty good indicator for the folks that are in the trenches, how they're self-identifying themselves today. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, let's see, how, uh, how realistic are these predictions? Um, how much of this is in the future, like way far off? How, how much are we still talking about Star Trek here? <laughs> how much of it is uh, next week? <laughs> Everything that I, that, that I just went through is in, exists today, every single bit. Um, so the question is, what's going to take off, what's going to not? Um, these are all technologies that, uh, on the, that are on the Gartner hype curve. Uh, most of them have not reached full maturity yet, so they're, they're not, you know, in that point of widespread adoption. Um, but I, I certainly would anticipate most of these uh, certainly being big shapers of our lives uh, over the next five years, absolutely over the next decade. Um, there's nothing on here that I think is far-reaching. Um, so if we were talking about uh, teleporters and you know those type of things. That'd be one thing, Lisa. Um, uh, uh, and even after you worked on too, right? But the uh, now these are things that I think are very practical, pragmatic, and we'll see in our lives soon. Again, I've, I've asked for a 3D printer for Christmas. Uh, it's it's like 500 bucks when I ask for. It's a big gift for sure, but it's not it's not insurmountable. You know, it's not like I asked my wife, honey, go spend five grand for you know a, a 3D printer for me, please. You know, <laughs> go buy a car for me. It's, you know, it's something that you know, could be budgeted for and that we could have in our home. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah, I would say, I can't quantify this, but my sense is that the pace of change is increasing. If we look at from the advent of the Internet, um, and I mean the real advent of the Internet, when it hit, uh, uh, it hit kind of critical mass in the late 90s, right? So probably around 96, 97, I think, is when uh, I think about the Internet starting to become something that most, more and more people were accessing. Um, so from then until uh, you know, 2006, you know, that growth was explosive. So huge, huge penetration, mm -hmm. huge growth. And then the introduction of the smartphone, particularly the iPhone, that was in 2007. So just, 
just six years ago. Um, the introduction of Facebook, that was just six, six years ago. And I don't know about you, but my sense is that the world today versus the world of six years ago is radically different. Yeah. Primarily because of those two technologies, the social media and mobile together. The world looks, feels, and acts differently. And if you don't believe me, then think about the Arab Spring. So that was social media on mobile that toppled governments. It changed the world in a very fundamental way. So I think if, if, so we went, if the 10 years for internet to reach the point where we went to mobile, and it's only taken six years for fundamental changes in our society because mobile and social media, what's the next horizon? Is it three? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But my sense is that the, the, the curve is exponentially increasing. Um, so it's, it's almost vertical at this point. You know, the, the, the curve, there's not much horizon left to the curve. I think we're just seeing massive, massive change on an ongoing basis. Yeah, the flood, the floodgates have been open, so to speak. I think so, and and yeah, and I think it's it's actually the idea of how, I how our brains work. You know, we make connections, um, we make neural connections as our brains are developing as infants, and the more connections that we make, the more connections are made, right? So it grows exponentially. Mm -hmm. More connections that exist allow us to become sentient. Um, and that once we reach sentience, then we start learning. Um, and the more we learn, the more connections we make. So that's, that's how, our, how we grow uh, in consciousness as humans. You know, the web of information that exists today, I'm not proposing that we're going to reach Skynet and have you know, sentient computers, although I wouldn't rule it out either uh, at some point in the future. <laughs> but the point is I think people are making more and more informational connections that uh, through these technologies that that then stimulates more growth and more thinking and more innovation. So the, so the, in, the opportunity for, for incremental and for fundamental innovation as a result of these informational connections that we make uh, on a global basis, I, I think it's, it, as you said, the floodgates are open. You know, it's, it's a constantly self-propagating process of new thinking and of leapfrogging uh, previous paradigms. A lot to think about. Um, so, do you have any recommendations of uh, books or other resources where um, the audience can learn more about uh, these types of data or technologies? You you mentioned quite a few uh, of your own resources, uh, conversations you've had, or or articles you've read. Uh, where could people go to learn more and and you know keep their finger on the uh, pulse of things? I'll tell you honestly, the best. Most of my information flows to me through social media. Um, uh, Twitter is a fantastic source uh, to have a steady influx of interesting content. Um, now specifically, what jumps out for for me uh, that I find most often being cited on Twitter are websites like TechCrunch, Mashable, uh, The Next Web. Um, they're generally very forward-looking, have, uh, have the latest on information. Uh, Warp is a great resource as well, particularly as it relates to marketing and the market research industry. Um, uh, Fast Company. Fast Company is a fantastic resource. Um, so uh, I, I look at that regularly as well. Um, LinkedIn groups. Stay deeply engaged with LinkedIn groups. Uh, uh, probably most of the people on this call, or many of them, are probably sick of me being so engaged on LinkedIn groups because I post prolifically on them. Um, uh, but it's really just allocating some time each day uh, for me to pay attention to what's coming in on uh, the variety of news feeds and taking a few minutes to glance at them. So I bookmark tons. I use Yammer uh, as well. Recently I started using Yammer within my company um, to, uh, to share interesting information so I can get back to it later and look at it. Um, you know, I, I probably devote an hour a day, at least, to just seeing what's happening and then thinking about how that may impact our business. And I, I want to be really clear with everybody. So I'm the former CEO of Rockhopper Research. Um, Rockhopper Research was a full-service company, um, and we failed 
to innovate effectively. So when the recession hit, first we took it on the chin like everybody else did, but a little bit worse because we were primarily focused on financial services. Um, so we really took it on the chin. And at that time, I started to think, God, how do I recreate my business? How do I reposition this company for success? And that started me on this journey of looking at these new technologies. And the decision that I made at that point was that because of uh, how badly we were hurting because of the recession um, and the new technologies that I saw emerging, there was not a path for Rock Hopper to reinvent itself and be relevant. My goal in everything that I do today, and I'm lucky to make a living doing this, is to help make sure other research companies don't fall into the same trap. I try and be that conduit of this data, of this information for you to a great extent um, so that you can examine it and be ready. Work now to reposition your company. You know, work now to be able to uh, understand what's coming and embrace change and drive change and see what happens. Because I, yeah, there's a quote from uh, Joe Tripoli at uh, uh, Coca-Cola a few years ago at ARF. Uh, and he asked the audience, if you don't like change, I bet you'll like irrelevance a whole lot less. And I think starkly those are the types of choices that, are fa that we're faced with today. Is stay abreast of what's happening, think about change, about how to change our companies, or increasingly risk and relevance in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent insight. Um, well, if anyone doesn't have, if, if anyone has any more questions, type them in quick. Um, but I think that that wraps up our, our uh, questions for the day. Um, Lenny, thank you so very much. Uh, this is really fantastic. Um, audience, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, please visit the Mid-Atlantic Chapter website for a listing of upcoming chapter events. Um, and uh, we will be sure that, um, that you get a copy of this as well as links to, um, to the presentation so you can share it with uh, your coworkers. Uh, right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jenny and Lisa. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me, there's my information. Feel free. Uh, I love a good debate. So uh, send me an email or... <laughs> well, when you get your 3D printer, be sure to send an invite to everyone. We'll all come down to your house and play with it for an afternoon. <laughs> Absolutely. That'll be fun. Oh, you, you know, I think that's why my wife probably won't buy it for me if she's concerned that I'll just be buried in my office, you know, playing. Um, <laughs> Printing things like ears and shoes. <laughs> oh, look, honey, I made a new frying pan. You know, whatever. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Take care.